So welcome everybody to this In Conversation with Anne Rainbow. It's the second time I've done an In Conversation with Anne and I was so impressed with how much she knew that um, it's so I'm really delighted that I've got her here again today and I have just actually booked her to do something else again in about a month on using the Scrivener tool which she'll talk about a bit later today and perhaps we'll have some time at the end. Now the way this is going to work today is I'm going to interview Anne to start with just very briefly and then she has provided some incredibly comprehensive slides which we're going to go through and there are four times during the slides when we're going to pause so that you can ask questions. You'll ask your questions using the chat and if we start to get a bit, bit uh, slow on time I'll just pause the chat so that Anne can continue her presentation and then we will pick up those questions at the end. The idea is that we will only run for an hour. If there are still some questions and if Anne still has time then, um, then we can keep going for a little bit longer. I am recording this. It will be available on my website, joeparfit.com, for you to watch later. It's also going to be on YouTube. And this presentation will be available to you as well. And if you would like it, um, then I can email it to you. So just ask me, joe at joeparfit.com, if you would like me to send it to you later. So I'm delighted to have Anne here today. I met Anne. 18 months ago when I went on a writing holiday that she was running with my great friend Christine and I was very impressed with how much Anne knows about editing. She runs a company called Red Pen Editing and has been helping people to edit their work for nearly 20 years we've just realised. But the interesting thing about Anne is that she began pretty much the same way as me. Anne began in um, the very late 70s, a little bit before me, writing for um, writing for computer handbooks, and mine weren't maths, mine were computer, but Anne has written many computer handbooks, as I have too. Um, but for many years now, she's been specializing in helping people to write full-length works, memoirs, and fiction. And she knows so much about the plotting, the themes, the characterization, the story arcs, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the theme and the story arc, which are two vitally important things to writing memoir and fiction. So um, thank you very much, Anne, for coming along today. We've got masses to learn. I know you've put, put together this very comprehensive presentation. So if you'd like to share your screen um, and people can still can still start writing their chats as soon as they like uh, and their questions in the chat as soon as they like. So over to you, Anne. Thank you very much. I'm hoping that's going to come up correctly. Yes, good. OK, so thank you, Joe. Uh, for, for inviting me back again. I'm glad that you were pleased with the, uh, the previous discussion we had on editing. Uh, welcome everyone to the presentation. There are quite a few slides, but I have grouped them and then we have these gaps for questions. So that should be, uh, that should work well. Uh, I am known as Scrivener Virgin, uh, gatekeeper of the Red Pen Path. And uh, for those of you who've not met me before, um, so I'm hoping that's going to take me a screen at a time. There we are, next screen. And um, this is me. Uh, on a sunny day. I do have a long list of uh, things I've done in my life because because I've been here a long time. If you want to check me out, just go to LinkedIn. It's all there. Okay, so story arcs and themes in fiction and memoir. This is the kind of uh, the, the idea for today. Uh, I have prepared, let's say, 22 slides and then I've grouped them. So we're going to get going with making sure we all understand what we're talking about, the terms I'm using. So the first slide is about memoir versus autobiography. So um, some of you will be thinking, yeah, yeah, I know already, but just to make sure, autobiography is a first person account of their own life. Memoir is also a first person account of a part of your life. With autobiography, the scope tends to be your whole life. Nowadays, celebrities do a, an autobiography when they're about 20. So it's their whole life up to 20, and then they can do more and more as they get older and older. Uh, for memoir, it tends to be a limited time scope that you choose to focus on. With autobiography, it tends to be a celebrity, somebody that everyone's heard of. Uh, they do a story in as just the facts about them and their life and the history, where they fitted into the history of whatever country they come from or the world. 
with a memoir, you focus on your journey, your personal journey, and it, is, it tends to be more about your emotional experiences during that, that time. Autobiography is quite often delivered in chronological order um, because it's easy. If you know the person's really famous, you're going to read it from that. You want to know what they were like as a kid, what, how they went through school, the career and everything else. And you're, as a reader, you're willing to uh, accept that order. And it's essentially a record of their achievements, which you just go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, the whole way through. For memoir, it's more likely that you create some kind of thematic structure to hold your reader's attention. And those give the reader a record of the lessons that you have learned uh, during your lifetime, effectively. Okay, so that's uh, memoir versus autobiography. Now let's have a look at uh, memoir versus fiction. So memoir is from memory, hence the term. And I've put an exclamation mark there because uh, some of us, our memories aren't quite as wonderful as we maybe think they are. Um, whereas fiction is invented. Or maybe it's based on your memory that you've kind of woven into a fiction. So memoir, in theory, is based on real events, whereas fiction is fictional events. Memoir is based on real people, whereas fiction is based on fictional characters. And then we have that memoir is a story which is part of your life that you want to share with your reader. Whereas in fiction, generally speaking, the author doesn't admit that it's their own life and they pass it over as being some kind of entertainment. So in memoir, you're looking to share the things that you've learned during your life. Whereas with fiction, the author tends to have some kind of uh, agenda as to what they would like people to know by the time they've, you know, how, how they'd like them to feel better educated, whatever, uh, by the end of the fiction. So, but there's an awful lot of parallels in there. Um, story arcs in memoir, which is part of the title of this, uh, this section, um, this presentation. Uh, basically, uh, we all know the difference now between autobiography and memoir, and we know the difference between memoir and fiction, but the slides I've got for you here, there's three of them on the topic of story arcs in memoir. Uh, then we'll pause for the questions. So if you have it as they occur to you, do just type them into the chat area straight away. But essentially, um, in writing a memoir, as opposed to an autobiography, there are some decisions to make. It comes down to the word scope. And for a memoir, you need a starting date before which you're not gonna uh, explain things. And you're also gonna take an ending date, which obviously is sometime up to the present date. But it needn't be yesterday or even today. It could be 10 years ago. Um, so that gives you a period of time, not your whole life to date, that you're going to focus on. It might just be the period, for me, for argument's sake, I was in teaching for about 10 years in, the, you know, in schools and colleges. So I could just do a memoir on life uh, as a teacher if I wanted to. Um, also, you have to decide which events you're going to include within that period of time. And I've written here transformational events. I'm not going to use that word a lot because when I was practicing this, it's a really hard word to keep on saying. So I'm going to call them important events. They're, they're events that matter to you. Now, it's which ones you include. It's not only important events important to you. It's important that you include them. But also, you have to start deciding which ones you're going to exclude. You can't include everything that happened, say, in a 10 year period. That's just not going to happen. Um, but they will be the events that made you change tack. They're the events that threw you off course, uh, not just the funny moments and the ones you normally share at a dinner party. It's not, it's not just anecdotes, this. It's the pivotal points in your journey so far. And that's what determines your scope. Uh, you want to share whatever lessons you learned during that period of time and they normally as a result of those pivotal points where you were made to rethink life. So remember that an autobiography is typically told in chronological order but a memoir doesn't necessarily have to. In fact it might bore the reader to death if you literally started on day one and presented them with what might be a journal almost. Um, and also note that there might be some events that happened before you've decided your start date is, things like uh, you, the fact you were born, where you went to school, the lives of your parents and your grandparents, those are, they might be necessary to slip in later on, snippets of information that will add colour to your story later on and maybe explain a few things, um, but, and they might add credence to the behaviours of others as well. So, but you do definitely need to decide on a start date and an end date, and the scope is the kinds of things you're gonna talk about uh, within those date, that, that date range, if you like. Now, 
If we look at story arcs in fiction, uh, as opposed to story arcs in memoir, I will compare the two in, in a second, but just thinking about fiction only, there are two arcs that are referred to in, um, uh, in fiction. A narrative arc, sometimes called a story arc, that's the arc of the whole story as told by the narrator. Now the narrator could be the author, it could be someone, one of the characters, it could be someone completely outside the story. So the narrative arc is the way the story is delivered to the reader through someone telling the story effectively. But then we also have what are called character arcs, which are the arcs of the um, individuals that you've included in your story. Um, now, with the character arcs, obviously they have a role. They might be the main character, they might be the antagonist, they might be, uh, they might be a relative of the main character, they, whoever they are, the goodies, the baddies and what have you. That has to be quite clear in your mind. I've then used the word goals, which is a bit of a, um, a generic term. What I really mean here is their wants and their needs. Now the wants are the things that are known to them, things they think they need, but they call them wants. So it's something external like wealth or fame or whatever it is they want. Um, the need is something that's internal to them. They perhaps don't realize they need. Uh, and because it's not known to the character, it's also not known to the reader at the start of the story. But as the story progresses, uh, something in the character has to grow. And it, it's the, there's a kind of balance between what they think they need, which they call their wants, what they actually need, which they don't realize. And as you get a bit into the story, um, these two things might not be the same, most probably aren't the same. The reader gets to know the wants because that comes out in the dialogue and the behavior and what have you. But at a deeper level, the reader discovers what the character needs. And in a positive arc, there's different kinds of arcs you can have for characters. Um, but looking at a positive arc, the character believes they want what they want, but eventually they realize, and it's usually about the middle of the story, they realize that that's a lie. They don't really need, they don't really need that at all. What they really need is what they really need, which they suddenly discover what it is. So there's a kind of a, uh, a light bulb moment halfway through the story when they think, no, I don't want to be rich and famous. I just want to be loved or something like that. Um, so there's a turning point and that's when the character actually starts their growth uh, and whether they get what they want or what they thought they wanted is actually irrelevant to the story. Now what I do when I'm writing fiction is I interview my, my uh, characters one at a time, I ask them lots of questions uh, and I write, I just, I treat it like a literally an interview. Uh, what's your name? Where'd you come from? How old are you? What's your job? That kind of thing. And I just go into some kind of zone and I find out and somewhere along the lines, I slip in the question. So what is it you really want? What do you think you need? And then that comes to me and I use it. Um, during the, the novel itself, you set them obstacle, an obstacle course because they can't have what they want. That's, that'd be just boring. Um, and during that process, there are lessons to learn. So that's the kind of very quick, uh, what about story arcs in fiction? There are whole books written on this. So I've done it in, I don't know, two seconds. But if we compare the two, this is the important thing. Um, comparing the two, um, we just said, well, memoirs start end over a period of time, transformational events. But actually, um, it is... Um, a kind of fiction, it's your fiction, it's your version of the truth. So the narrative arc, who's telling the story, that's you. And the character arcs, those are all the people in your life who you've decided to include within your memoir. So um, the, the lessons that you can learn from creating story arcs in fiction, you can actually apply to your memoir very well. So you are telling the story, it's your narrative arc, you're also the main character and you will have had goals along the way and met obstacles and you've learned some lessons, presumably. Um, the obstacles are generally your transformational events, the pivot points you had. Um, and then just as uh, all the characters in your story, you know, it's not just you that learns lessons as, as life goes on, everyone around you presumably is learning lessons as well. So in much the same way as you might devise a plot in fiction, it makes sense to consider the transformational events in your life, just list them out in chronological order. Um, you know, went to college, got qualified, started a career, got married, had kids, divorced, 
you know, all the things that happen, the big um, events that happen in your life. Um, look at uh, the gaps between them. They might be quite wide. You might want to slip in a few extra ones, but essentially create your own obstacle course, the one you've already been through. And although your story might build on one main conflict, uh, there probably were additional challenges. I mean, for me, I had a disastrous first marriage. Uh, one of the conflicts was my father-in-law. So, you know, I'm never going to write a memoir, I promise. But, you know, if I did write anything, you know, he would certainly be in it because he was, um, he made a difference to my life. Um, the, another little thing while I mention it, while I'm here, you can start your memoir with how things are now. That is, that's an option. And then go back to the beginning and then bring the reader up to date. And um, that's one option. I can't slip that in at that point. And now we've got question time. So basically, any questions so far? Uh, can I see the questions where I am? I don't think I can. So There are some questions, Anne, but actually the questions were to do with Scrivener from Geraldine and from Sarah. And then Angela has responded and told them what to do. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, you don't need to answer that, <laughs> to answer it. So that's great. So thank you very much for that, Angela. Um, thank you so much. That was so comprehensive, Anne. There were many, many gems in that. I, I thought that... Um, I, I learned something along the way too. I thought that was incredibly interesting, comparing autobiography with memoir and then memoir with fiction. Of course, they say that all memoir is fiction because mm, it's sure. it's written through our own lens. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I have a question for you myself about the uh, life lessons that people should um, try and uh, make, uh, get the reader to learn as they're uh, writing their memoir. How overt do you think that they should be? Well, it depends on, it depends on the individual. I mean, uh, what do they say? Softly, softly, catchy monkey. If you, if you lecture somebody, you'll probably turn them off. Uh, if you can demonstrate something by, you know, show rather than tell. If you can um, have your, uh, your character yourself go through a situation which was clearly unwise, shall we say, uh, with hindsight. Uh, and then the reader will think, well, she shouldn't be doing that. I mean, that's going to go wrong. And then it goes wrong. And they go, yeah, I told you it would go wrong. Mm. And then afterwards, the writer, you, can say, of course, I was too young and silly to realise, da da I should have listened to my mother. Um, and, you know, that, that way, the reader, if they didn't spot the mistakes in the first place, hopefully by the time they've seen the damage it does, and then seen your reflection on the damage it did and how silly the action was, they will pick up that life lesson. But I don't, I don't think you want to start off with, um, you know, never marry before you're 30, because that's going to be, that it's argumentative and you're not necessarily right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if you make pronouncements, you're almost picking a fight with the reader. Whereas if you just show them what you did, they might go, well, dear, oh dear. Or they might go, yeah, mm -hmm. I did that as well. Uh, yeah. some, people, some people get away with stuff. You know, they make the same mistakes as we do, but they get away with it. It doesn't go as badly wrong. Mm, um, interesting. I yeah, would be less than overt. Yeah, I see. That's great. Uh, Jeremy, we've got some questions now. Jeremy has said, um, can you please talk about the two voices of the narrator, both the adult looking back and the person you were at the time? I was talking to someone only about this the other night, actually. She's writing a novel uh, which is largely based on her own life. And uh, she was talking to me about how she would tackle it because, you know, she's now in her 60s and she wants to talk about when she was in her 20s so I did explain to her I would recommend that she wrote the outline uh, this, this is supposed to be a fiction but it's you know it's a fiction based on her, her memoir um, I would be inclined to to think of them as being two different voices uh, write your outline work out whether it's a young person speaking or it's the old you speaking and then I would Spend a bit of time looking through old photos and maybe reading some letters that you had at that time, reading your diaries at that time. Get back into the voice you used to be. You know, if you read a diary that you wrote 30 years ago, it's, it's, it's a different voice from the one you're using now. So I would go back to that, immerse yourself in the you that you used to be. It could be quite cathartic. It could be quite upsetting to do this. Just get it over and done with and write all the scenes that you want to from that young person's point of view in one hit and then go and dark lie in a dark room for a bit uh you know get over that and then come back to being the grown-up person that you are now 
and start talking in your new older voice, um, the one you, you normally use. That's it's a bit that's sort of schizophrenic, to be honest with you. Yeah, I can see that, but I can also see, I'm increasingly seeing the more I get to know you, how useful something like Scrivener could be for writing <laughs> those scenes and then being able to put everything, jigsaw puzzle it all back together again. Yeah, I, can, I can see that. Um, we've had a question from John who says, how can you balance the main idea of a memoir to, to, um, to present, for example, progress towards a goal with the wish to also tell of some interesting environments, funny, funny events, etc., that may not directly address the character arc. Quite a long question there. Did you grasp it? Yeah, what I would be inclined to do um, is to identify um, various scenes as being like essential to the story, essential to the theme, and others as being, if you like, icing on the cake, uh, which might be funny or might be sad. So they have an emotional um, input, as it were. I would focus on, uh, you, you don't want it to be massively long, you know, it can't be too long. So I would focus on getting the uh, bare bones in, the big rocks in, if you like, the big pivotal points in your life. And then if you read and think, oh, it's a bit boring, it's a bit dull, then that's when you start painting in a few little uh, snippets here and there to make the reader sigh, to make the reader laugh, to make the reader think, uh, you know, that you're human <laughs> mm -hmm. um, instead of some kind of automaton. So I, but I would focus on those big rocks first get them done and it's what's weird about writing memoir the more you write the more you remember mm -hmm. so rather than thinking you've got to use everything start with using the things you've got to use and then think about how you're going to sandwich that it would be nice to have maybe a serious uh, explanation of some part of your life followed by but it was really funny when art Maud fell in the river you know something like that which you can um it, there's always a funny side isn't there to, to any mm -hmm. Drama, you know, drama that goes on. I see. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Sarah has asked, "What is a good chapter length, um, and how many flashbacks is it okay to include? Are there any rules?" Um, how long's a, a a chapter is a bit like how long's a piece of string. Um, we did talk about this in the editing one actually last mm. time. Essentially, uh, it would it would be lovely if all your chapters were roughly the same length because that warns the reader after they've read two or three, they'll get into your rhythm. So whether you have lots of short chapters or lots of long chapters, that's up to you. Uh, if you're writing a, um, a fiction, you would actually probably have a mix of short and long, but equally that could apply to memoir because you might have some really sad, you know, supposing your grandparents, or one of your grandparents died and this was really traumatic. You don't need a long chapter on that. Most of us have had mm. a grandparent that's died. So you, you're tapping into the reader's understanding already. But if it's a chapter about your life as a drilling rig inspector, and none of us have been a drilling rig inspector, <laughs> you've got to give us enough detail so we can understand what you're talking about. That might be quite a long chapter. So it's horses for courses on the chapters. Um, the other question was, sorry. How many flashbacks are okay to include? Oh, um, what I would, uh, with memoir, with fiction, let's do fiction first, with fiction, Flashbacks should only relate to times after the start of the novel. So it's before the start of the novel. So as the novel progresses, you know, from day one through to day, whatever it is when it ends, um, it is possible to have flashbacks within that that revert back to say yesterday or last week. And that's a technique where you are, you want to tell the reader what happened, but not to let the reader be there at the time it happened. Now this is particularly mm -hmm. useful if the um, event was a rape for argument's sake putting getting blunt if there's a rape you don't necessarily want to to show the rape what you want to show is the effect of people after the event uh, of that event so um, you do that as a flashback probably uh, if you want to give uh, information of what happens to characters before the story starts that could be done through dialogue hasn't got to be done through flashbacks um, if the if the delivery of the story involves a lot of internal um, wrangling then maybe there's a lot of flashbacks but really they they detract from the forward movement of a story in mm. memoir i'm not sure there's an awful lot of point in having flashbacks because you're looking back all the time anyway and it might be kinder on the reader to deliver it in the order in which it happened um, so that they you know they walk the walk with you um, and they are not having to work out 
was this before or after or whatever. Um, so I would be inclined in memoir not to have too many flashbacks at all, if you know, unless you think it's absolutely essential. I can't imagine right this second why I'd want to have flashbacks because you are reporting on the past. Now, so has, has it frozen? You seem to have frozen to me. I can't see you, Joe. You seem to have frozen. <clears throat> and maybe can I can I ask you a question while we're waiting for Joe to come back? Yes, do yes, do, Jeremy. <laughs> so my question is about what about using real names in a memoir? <clears throat> in a memoir, does it make any difference if the person is alive or dead? Um, basically, if if he's a real person, then I can't. I don't think there should be any reason why you shouldn't use their name. What, what you can't do is libel them. Um, you know, you can you can tell the truth about your experiences with them, but what you mustn't do is write something that they'll then sue you for. Um, and also, if if you what I have done a bit of uh, proofreading years and years ago uh, of memoir, what you mustn't do as well is to change the name but keep the events accurate. So somebody else can say, "Oh, that was me." <laughs> they're writing about me they just changed things that's okay well i don't know if show can hear she said her internet's died so we'll just carry on i've come back oh you're back brilliant <laughs> i'm back yes yeah, sorry a little just panic, carry on without me <laughs> we did carry on without you i just answered a question about uh something but anyway um shall i sh shall i go back should we go to section two i think we need to go to section two yes yes sorry about my internet um let me just share that and then section two is about theme um so okay let me just get on my screen over here so i've got my notes here um well why have a theme in the first place um but basically the reason you have a theme in the first place is that that's why you're telling this story you must there must be something that you woke up one morning and i must tell people how i recovered some awful event or how i got through my you know and that can inspire other people to be able to do it as well quite often happens when people have some awful illness or near-death experience and they want to share uh, how they got through that trauma so the theme is not usually uh, stated the reader has to get it by reading what you have to say about the events um, so the theme is is shown not told that's the important thing um, when you start off you might not be clear initially some people are crystal clear but some people might not be clear about they just think oh I want to write a memoir um, but if you can work out what your theme is it will help you to avoid including material you don't need that's the kind of bottom line of that one um, but frankly, if you haven't worked out what your theme, you'll end up including loads of stuff. Later on, you might take it out again. Um, but you must remember that people, barring your friends and family, um, assuming they're still speaking to you by the time you've written it, um, ultimately they won't be picking up your memoir to read about you. They actually want to learn something from your story. So that's why people read memoir, unless you are some massively famous rock star or something. Um, you know, they, they actually want to know about your story. So one way of doing, uh, working out what your theme is to mind map. So I'm sure everyone's come across what a mind map looks like. Um, but essentially you start off with something in the middle. So I just wrote the word memoir there. And then you, um, you know, you should pick, you know, just an A4 sheet of paper would do to start off with. Um, word in the middle and then uh, write down anything that comes to you. So you might write down the people in your life, the characters, you might write some words down, you know, like happy, sad, uh, shattered, um, whatever it was. You might produce a timeline, the settings that happened when, when various, you know, when you moved from here to there, when you got a new job, when the kids were born, that kind of thing. The, the then and now, you might um, like to write almost like you're journaling. What did it mean to you then and what does it mean to you now? Really quite important to reflect on things. And then surround yourself with images. These could be photographs, it could be notebooks, you know, whatever you've managed to accumulate all over, you know, in your lifetime. So it's all spread out, if you like, either on your screen or your desk or all over your bed or something. And then you start looking at it and deciding, um, you know, are there things that are linked to each other that you could group together in some sensible way? Um, and which bits do you want to include? Uh, you might find yourself thinking, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. So you, you're immediately starting to eliminate things as well. Um, all the time when you're collating all this stuff, some themes might come to you. Um, you know, how to overcome 
with me. How to overcome the worst father-in-law in the world. There you go. There's the theme. How to cope with people who try and stop you getting what you want. That kind of thing. Um, and all of that might give you uh, a theme word. It might not. It might give you another idea altogether. So you just got another piece of paper and you might write in the middle. Um, <laughs> I know we have some men and women here, but for me, I would write maybe in the middle men. And then I could write around that the various men in my life. Uh, my father, my brother, um, my first husband, my current husband, my son, my son-in-law. And I could actually kind of look at how they fitted into my life. So you might find that you start looking at a slice of your life and that might end up being um, a chapter in the book uh, if, it, if it works that way. Um, if you aren't sure, are you think, oh no, I want to start with a theme, give me a theme, Anne, and then I'm going to write my memoir. You can get a book and this is a book called Writing the Hawaii Memoir. Uh, I haven't counted the number of items on that list, but it's a lot and they are all themes. And you could just say, OK, anger, gratitude, uh, cooperation, jealousy, war, any of those could be themes and you could choose several of them to good effect. But I, I personally would suggest um, that you don't worry too much about actually pinning the theme instantly. Just go for the pivotal points in your life. Um, you do have some tools at your uh, disposal. So you're looking really for a main theme and possibly some sub themes. That's your objective. The tools that you have to hand are any journals that you've written, diaries and anything that you have um, record wise uh, in your possession. So it might even be somebody else's diaries. You know, your mother has died or your grandmother has died and you've ended up with a carrier bag full of bits and bobs. And when you go through it, you find letters that you wrote to them when you were at summer school or something. And that will give you some insight. You've also got the benefit of hindsight. This may or may not be a useful tool because um, as some we said earlier, you know, memoir is, is like fiction and you are also, ha ha, wise after the event. So you, that is a pitfall rather than a tool because you might view things differently from how you really ought to. Um, and it is possible that you'll end up uh, in emotional pits. Now, just going through them one at a time, those journals and diaries really, really important. And if you're not writing one right now, I would recommend you start writing one right now because you might uh, end up writing your memoir in 10 years time or it might take you 10 years to write it and those will be useful to you. Um, if you go back to the ones you wrote when you were 15, 20, the interesting thing is uh, they were written by the you that you were then, not the one that you are now after all the traumas you've been through. Um, when you have your hindsight, this is you need to be very careful you're not looking at things with the wrong spectacles on um, because that's that's too easy. And being wise after the event is so easy afterwards to say, oh, well, if I hadn't have done this and I hadn't have done that, sliding doors kind of attitude, why did I make that choice? What would I do differently now if I knew what I know now? You know, it's, it's, it's too easy. But these questions can help you to formulate your memoir. It might be that part of the reason you are where you are now is you made some really bad decisions, but they seem like a good idea at the time. So. You know, being wise after the event, uh, try and do it without judging yourself too much or beating yourself up too much. On the emotional pits, I, I, have, I have spoken with somebody about my um, past life um, issues, as it were, one time. And it was really helpful to talk to somebody and I explained how I saw it. But they knew me when I was back then and they said, well, that's not how I remember it. And so um, if they have some knowledge of your history, not too much, you know, not, not necessarily a brother or a sister, but somebody who you knew at school maybe, who can say, well, I don't remember it that way. Um, but they may also be able to say, what's coming through to me is that you are still angry about X, Y, Z, you know, jealousy of your brother, or it wasn't fair, something or other, you know, they maybe can help you to head towards your theme. But I would advise, you know, to any memoir, your first task involves putting together those events out of memory, um, lining them up on paper, developing themes that make, seem to make sense to you, um, and the big, the big rocks, as it were, uh, whichever the emotional consequences were of things, all of the uh, compelling forces that were on you at the time, that kind of, you know, you've been pushed this way, pulled that way, and then you made a decision. Uh, and I would wait until you've written your outline before, uh, and maybe even the whole of the first draft, before you really 
trying to establish your theme because uh, it can change you know in the unfolding and the same goes for the title some people say oh i've got a fantastic title for my memoir they haven't even written it yet and um, so don't spend ages trying to dream up the perfect title it'll come and it has to match your theme in some way otherwise it won't be saleable um, and that will fall into place it'll just come to you one day when you're in the shower or out walking the dog or something you're suddenly oh yes that's what i'm going to call it time for questions well thank you Anne. again so comprehensive um really we need a transcript of this whole thing it's been it's <laughs> phenomenal so far um i love that line you used it can change in the unfolding yeah it does i i, re I really like that but it also made me think that you've you've given us all those uh, you gave us that wonderful list of potential themes and i think that um I always say there are many different ways to skin a cat as there, and there are as, as many ways to write a book. It doesn't matter as long as you pick one way and you may, I believe, set out trying to write it one way, but in the unfolding, you think, well, actually it doesn't have to be all about loss and despair. It could be all about hope and optimism and you just find a different spin on it. So what matters is that you're consistent. I think you've been incredibly helpful with, with, thinking of what the, the big rocks are and the transformational events and finding out where where you change in some way so i think those things are all incredibly useful um i i i think that you said so can you confirm this that you people tend to read memoir because of the story but you i think you were intimating it's it's also largely to do with the resonance and how much it resonates with the reader well, if, yes, if you think about it, I mean, you, if you're in the library and you're looking at you know, something you're going to read or you're at the airport uh, bookshop and you're mm. thinking about what you're going to have, um, if somebody's mad keen on sport, they might read the memoir of a sportsman that they know and they admire that, because they're interested in the person. Mm. But if there's a memoir that's written by somebody who's, got, who's managed to come through some awful disaster um, and they have either been in, in the same position or they've always dreaded that kind of situation, they, they may well be interested in that memoir because you're telling the story. Or, you know, if, this is going to get a bit heavy, but if someone's written a story about, say, get, coping with abusive relationships or recovering from uh, some kind of abuse, you know, whether it's rape or whatever it is, if somebody tells the uplifting story of how they put it behind them and how they've made a new life for them, uh, then that can be, for somebody who's still in the pit, and doesn't know if they can get out that might give them the courage uh, inspiration to get themselves out of a mess so um there are there are also ones that are written you know people who have very little education and somebody says i never went to high school but look where i am now mm. uh, that kind of thing can inspire people to embark on a journey that maybe they wouldn't have had the courage to do in the first place mm. um i mean my own story i left my ex-husband after 29 years but we split up the first time after seven years, but I did another 20 years for reasons of my own. Um, but I, 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 and I'm not gonna write that memoir because I would not like to encourage women to leave their husbands because everyone has to make up their own decisions. But mm. for some people, they might say, they might think that their method, uh, their, their strategy was the right one and they want to encourage everybody else to do it. So mm. um, you do end up with a niche market if you're, memoir is about some overcoming some awful thing because yeah. it, it probably only appeals to those people who are in it or who have got out of it um or the ones who get vicarious pleasure from it but um you know it's memoirs a tricky area actually mm, yes i'm sure i'm sure so in a way maybe it makes it safer to go for a much a theme that is less niche and more um that is likely to resonate with a larger group of people. I, yeah. I can see we've actually had some questions in now, so I'm going to stop asking you my questions. Um, Jeremy has said, as with the length of a chapter, is the ideal recommended number of chapters or pages as long as a piece of string as well or not? Absolutely, absolutely. You've got to, uh, you'll have a style of writing, uh, you'll have a pace of writing, and you your readers will read at their pace. If you are... Um, if you're if you go on and on and on and on and you bore them they won't even read to the end so it doesn't matter how long or short your chapters or how many there are you have to have a, uh, a delivery which is 
um, you know, page turning kind of thing. But if you've got lots of things to tell people, then, you know, then tell them lots of things. Uh, but you have to be quite discerning as to, are they really that interesting? They might yeah. seem fascinating to you, but might not be to the deliverer. I would be inclined, if you think you've got a, a, a very long story and you've got, you know, 70 chapters, um, I would write them, get it done, and then give it to some beta readers and see what they say. Somebody might have the courage mm. to say, do you know what? You could have lost the middle 10 chapters because they were really not that interesting. Yes, that's interesting. I mean, you say that any number of chapters is fine. I would, um, I would caution against writing too long because I know from experience that it costs a lot of page paper costs money and publishers are less going to be less interested in a new writer who has written more than, let's say, Oh, 350 yeah, yeah. pages because it's harder to sell and it's harder to make a profit on it's different if you're jojo moyes and they know that they'll sell anything you've written That's but right. if you're new they're not likely so i would always say aim for under ninety thousand, but but pre preferably somewhere between 70 and and mm -hmm. 80 um would probably be a bit better for a, a memoir i would say but if somebody has written say 120 thousand words and they think it's all valuable if you pass it out to beta readers they'll soon tell you which bits you could lose. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a very good point. Um, Sarah has asked a question that we haven't really touched on, so I'm not sure if it's appropriate or not, about, about libel. Um, is it, is it libelous to do my family dialogue but, dialogue but not specify who said it? Can you comment at all on that, Anne? If you, the thing about it is you've got to look at it from the person's point of view who, who reads this and is mightily offended. If it's in any way attributable um, and recognisable, they will be offended. I'll, I'll give you an example. It's quite simple. I did a lot of proofread on TV programmes, and one of them was on the Avengers. You, um, hopefully some of your um, mm. attendees remember the Avengers. Mm -hmm. um, and there, it was um, in it, it suggested that Linda, somebody or other, Linda Thor Thorson or Thorson, something like that, um, it suggested that she only got the job because she slept with the director or slept with the uh, leading actor or somebody. And while I was proofreading it, I said to my husband, who my ex-husband was working together, I said to him, is it true that she, he said, I don't know. I said, oh, it sort of, it kind of, it kind of says it here. It doesn't, it doesn't say it explicitly, but it kind of suggests it. So when I sent the job back to the publisher, you know, with our invoice, I said, oh, by the way, on page 92, it kind of suggests, and I'm, I, I don't know the truth or not of it, um, but you know, maybe you should be aware of this. Now, it had already been through copy editing, obviously, but that hadn't been brought up. Um, anyway, they, it was passed to their legal department, and, but the printing went ahead. Uh, the legal department came back and said, don't print it. Apparently it was true, apparently it was true, but it doesn't matter whether something's true or false. In fact, you're worse off printing, printing something that's true because, because people can get really, really angry that you've revealed the truth. If you print lies about them, they've got to prove that you've defamed them in some way and you've ruined their lives. Um, but printing the truth about someone is a pretty tricky area. Um, so you need to be very careful. I'd say they pulp those books. They couldn't, Gosh. they didn't sell them. Um, so I would be very careful about writing things that you consider to be true and may well be true because somebody did really, really say it. But in You have to, it's not just a case of whether you are breaking the law, it's whether you're behaving as a reasonable human being towards other human beings who have mm. feelings. You know, what are you hoping to gain by revealing that Aunt Maud was a vicious bitch? <laughs> I mean, just, you know, what is the point? The woman's dead or, you know, I mean, it's, it's past, so. Mm. Yeah. I think I need to move on though. Um, I think you need to move on, yes, it's quarter two. We're now gonna look at, um, why treat memoir like fiction? So I'm going to I'm going to rattle through these a bit. I'm yes. afraid. Um, basically, you treat memoir like fiction because fiction has a tried and tested formula. And as much as formula might make you go, oh, uh, actually, formulas are there because they work. Because it provides a guide uh, to memoir writers. It really does provide you with a guide. It will allow you to meet the expectations of audience because they've been pre-programmed as well. That therefore will improve your chances of publication which will improve your chances of sales, because if you don't get published, you will not sell anything. Mm. The bog standard structure is a three act structure. Um, it's just called the three act structure. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. 
Uh, in the beginning, you meet the main character, which is you, because you're, it's your memoir. And you'll also meet the people around you. You set up the problems and desires and conflicts and stuff. Um, the middle area is where you have the journey, as it were. And at the end, you have some kind of climax and tying up loose ends. I would suggest that in a memoir, this narrative arc might not be the arc you use for the whole book, but it might be the arc you use for each chapter. Because if a chapter is on the theme, say, of education or marriage or something, you would tell the story with a beginning and a middle and an end. And this structure seems to work uh, in fiction in the big novel, uh, but it also could work in the smaller structure, which is a chapter and even in themes. Um, so having some kind of uh, narrative arc in a memoir means you're telling a true story that builds to a climax. With memoir and fiction. This is mm. what it looks like at the diagram. A bit kind of mathematical book this, um, where you have, uh, uh, you start off with exposition, you have what we call rising action, a crisis, a climax, falling action, and then denouement. Um, and the inciting incident is dotted towards the end of the exposition. So there's this particular shape that is put in all the textbooks. Notice that the vertical axis is complication, so it gets more complicated at the cl climax. It starts low, ends low, but there's this kind of peak in the middle. Here's a prettier picture of the same thing. Um, and this one actually shows you where the act one and two and three um, markers are. So you can see where it's, um, it's broken. And the midpoint is in the middle of act two. So you, again, this is just a diagram. Anyone who's looked at uh, any kind of books on this will have, uh, have seen something very similar. Here's the two of them together to show that it doesn't matter which book you look at, they're all the same kind of shape. So there's no, there's no mystery in, you know, Mr. X's version of the three act and Mrs. Y's version, they're all the same. Uh, mm. It just fits into that structure. Um, but some of you might prefer, rather than diagrammatic uh, versions, a list version. Now these are two, they're actually in Scrivener, as it happens, because that's what I use. The left-hand one uh, is the K.M. Whelan's um, structure. It's a three-act structure. So you've got one A, one B, and then two A, B, C, D, and then three A for her acts. Uh, she provides this as a template for Scrivener. So if you're writing a novel or a memoir and you want to use this structure, you could just download it and Bob's your uncle. She's also written a book on um, structure uh, and character arcs. She's written millions of books. Uh, she's really very good. I would recommend uh, signing up to her newsletter because she's always publishing really good articles. Could you give me her name again? I didn't actually get that. Yeah, yeah. K.M. Whelan. That's K. I think it's K for K. K-A-Y. M. And then uh, Whelan is W-E-I-L-A-N-D. She's a very pretty lady, quite young, but she's very knowledgeable on just about everything to do with uh, writing. So, um, excellent. The one on the right hand side is the Save the Cat 15 beat structure, again split into three acts. I quite like this one because it breaks the story down into smaller challenges for me as a writer. Um, but it might also help the memoir writer to um, think about the kind of things that you would want to include. So you have an opening image that just you know sets the theme. The theme is then stated. Now the interesting thing about theme stated um, implied by another character who challenges the main character so you could have i mean again in my story my mum said to me before i married my first husband don't marry him you'll regret it right and i said oh i know what i'm doing so you know you will regret it would have been the theme of my story if i were to write a memoir um and uh, and, and there it came in that i could have included that scene at the beginning and that would have been it and then there's various others b10 is bad is closing b11 is all is lost and so on so mm. you, you do need to buy the book for this one um i have it here which i can that's a save the cat book um mm. i would assent, i would recommend anyone who's writing a novel to read it if you're writing memoir then there's there are other ones that you can have a look at um now we were going to stop for a question time but i think i need to carry straight on to be honest with you yeah mm. um, yes do because um the other thing which is very useful uh, about the Save the Cat is that they offer what are called uh, generic specific plots. So when you're looking for your story arc, it depends what kind of story you're telling actually, as to, you know, the three act is pretty simplistic, this uh, kind of slopey thing with a peak, but 
you could argue that in your story, um, that these are the 10 that the Save the Cat offer you, you could argue that your section on career, if you had a chapter or two on career, it could be a, a full triumphant story. That's, that was the kind of uh, genre that you were in when you were having your career. During your marriage, it could be the fall in the house, on a monster in the house, um, only kidding. But you know, it might be that if you look at different parts of your life, the story falls into a different kind of genre, actually. Um, you know, there might be a why done it, there might be a superhero. And so if you look at these, you can, uh, you can decide whether you can structure your memoir to suit the three act structure for this specific plot. That's a lot of words in that sentence. But mm. um, there's a lot of help out there. If 10 is not enough for you, this book, which is called <laughs> <laughs> 20 Master Plots, apparently this is the definitive list of plots. So your structure, your plot of your, your memoir, must fall into one of these. And uh, I would say, well, you don't have to have it fall into one of these because um, it's a bit sort of narrow minded. You might have that certain aspects of your memoir fall into one of these. Something on sacrifice, maybe something on rescue, something on underdog. It depends on what your life has been like as to exactly which of those you fall into. Um, but I think it's really important to look at types of plots. And those are the two books again, Save the Cat by Jessica Brody and 20 Master Plots mm. by Ronald B. Tobias. In, in your memory, but identifying which structure works for you, I mean, I think the three acts got to work for everybody, but working out which of the genres fits in with your memoir is another, is another challenge. Okay, now let's get down some nitty gritty. Plot versus story. Um, people interchange these words. I'm, this is my plot, this is my story, but actually a plot is physical. They are physical events. Those transformational events that knock you sideways, those are your plot points. It's your, your, because you're the main character, your physical journey. And the plot does equal the action. You know, you changed jobs, you got married, you had kids, you, you whatever you did, climbed Everest. And all of those are described in what we call scenes. Uh, they are a scene to me is a time, a place, and a cast of characters. As soon as the time or place or cast of characters changes, it's a new scene. And so you need a scene about whatever was important in your life, whichever events were important. However, the story comes out because it tells the emotional journey, your main character's emotional journey. So plot's physical and story is emotional. And the way that you weave these together is that the plot gives you the action, but the story gives you the reaction, your reaction to what, you know, lemons were thrown at you. And the way you deliver those is what we call sequels. They're just the same as scenes, um, but they are more about your, re your reaction, your uh, reflection, and you, you are presented with a, oh my goodness, look what just happened, followed by this changes everything, followed by what am I going to do next? And that kind of thought process happens in a sequel. Now in a memoir, it's really, really important to include sequels uh, at frequent intervals so that your reader um, sees the action and then finds out what you thought about it. It is important what you thought about it because it's your memoir. If you just deliver them all the action, but don't comment on it as to how it affected you, then they're not gonna get under your skin. They're not gonna understand how you tick. So it's really quite important that you share that. And that's, and that's quite hard for some people to write. As far as scenes versus chapters, you, some of you were asking about how long should a chapter be, but it actually boils down to how many scenes are in it. In a novel, I would recommend that uh, you write the first draft as scenes with their sequels uh, and do the same for memoir. With, uh, with a novel, very quickly, I, you can have lots and lots of scenes followed by a sequel. And what will happen then is the, the reader gets more and more impatient thinking, what is the main character gonna do? I've got, I can see nothing, I've, there's no reaction. They're just being pummeled, you know, one obstacle after another and I'm not finding out what's wrong with them. And then, the main character blows, it literally blows their top, and then that's a certain shape, if you like. With memoir, I think you do need to balance your scenes and your sequels. So you deliver some action and you explain what you thought. More action, what did you think? And so on. So you are, you're layering it a bit at a time. So they are walking it with you. They know how you felt. 
When you get to the second draft, if you were writing a novel, you would group the scenes into chapters. Now this would be according to the plot progression. You've got your structure and you've got your plot. And also who's preventing the point of view? Because if you've got more than one point of view, you'll need to intersperse them to, you know, to create some kind of delivery. But if you're writing a memoir, you could group those scenes into chapters according to theme or something or time periods. So you might have written something about all these various pivotal points, but they don't necessarily all belong in separate chapters. There might be a chapter that has, or a series of chapters that has several major things that happened. And then there might be another chapter which doesn't have an awful lot happening, but has a lot of um, a sub theme when, when you realize something. It could be one tiny little theme. How everything fitted together. So with memoir, grouping things into chapters, I don't think is quite as simple. Um, I think it's, if you just concentrate on the scenes and what you want to deliver and then see about putting them together, uh, that would make sense. Okay, so we've now reached, where are we time-wise? I have just got oh. two more slides on what can go wrong and recommendations. Will that make sense, Joan? I'm not sure that we, I think that you've covered so much. I think it's probably be better to turn over to questions, to be honest, because okay. I think there's just so much here. Um, and if you'd like to um, stop sharing your screen. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I think this has been so phenomenally comprehensive. I think if anybody would like Anne back to discuss anything in particular from this and to take a small segment to go into more detail, then, then I'm very happy to have her back if Anne's, very, if Anne's happy to come. Um, as I've had, um, Aisha did ask a little while ago if um, a memoir has to finish at, on a positive note. <laughs> wow. Depends if you want them to go away and cut their wrists, really, isn't it? I mean, if you, I would, it would be quite, it would be quite nice to end on a positive note, or at least an optimistic note, you know. Um, so um, <laughs> it's uh, it's up to you. I mean, in a novel, you in the novel, the main character doesn't have to get what they they wanted in the first place. They could end up not getting it, but instead they get what they need. If you think about it, with a memoir, your reader needs something. And maybe you need to make sure you give them that. Uh, if only, you know, you might say my life's been a disaster, um, but I do hope reading this, it gives you the courage not to allow yours to be the same or something. So mm. At least a positive end. Um, yes, Geraldine's asking, what were the common mistakes? I can yes, and so did uh, somebody else. What were yeah. the common mistakes? If you want to share the screen, because it's easier than do. But I will send everybody the file, the complete file, if you would like it yeah so fact, I, I, I can screen. add the, i can add the i'll add the file here to you so that you can download it yeah basically there's four things that can go wrong uh factophilia uh trees no woods and stockholm syndrome and overwhelm factophilia means that you absolutely flood your book with so much information that you completely drown the reader in it and they are bored to death with it uh it may be that you know you you're obsessive about love of facts and dates and everything else and you think they're really important, but as far as the readers are they're not actually that relevant. So uh, you're sidetracking in some way. So you need to weave them into your, your, your story in such a way that they become interesting and informative, but not overwhelming for the reader. The trees, not woods. This is where you get so lost in your own uh, investigation into your life story that you completely forget the whole point is to present something to the reader which is entertaining and informative. Uh, Stockholm is a similar kind of thing you become you've been taken hostage by the project and you just can't see the wood for the trees you can't see anything you you don't you know you're just lost the overwhelm is the word you love the writing of it you love the researching of it but now you've got to edit it and get it to a point where you can publish it so that's um, that's what can go horribly wrong for people. They write it and then they think oh, that it'll have to do. I can't, I can't face going through it. So, um, that's very helpful. They'll see that when they, I was just going to uh, type in your um, website address here for those who would like to know more about you and does work with um, people on a one-to-one -one basis and you do run workshops. Are you running workshops during uh, this, these times of Zoom? No, um, basically what I've, I've 
I launch every year the Red Pen Editing Series and so I revamp all of those courses. So there's a live webinar when they're launched and then people follow the courses. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm busy on that at the moment. But with the mentoring, I deliver a, a monthly workshop online and the topic is whatever the people involved want me to do. So it's much a free for all kind of thing. Um, and, uh, but no, I'm just doing it with you, Joe, because you asked. So I did do, uh, I did do one for Pro Writing Aid as well a little while ago. They asked, they, they had a similar thing. What can we keep people happy with? And I had a call from them. But you clearly know so much, Anne. And I noticed from um, looking at, at your website that if people join Red Pen and they pay £10 a month, they get access to Scrivener and they can they they can they get access to courses and to your red pen way book is, yeah. is that correct was there yeah. something i've missed out no basically what happens is if they join uh, the 10 pound a month subscription scheme um they're not too late to join now we actually started in march they then have a series of six courses it's not compulsory but i, I think it's really important for people to do them and i have the launch webinar which is then if they've arrived late it's actually within the course and the courses are quite detailed there's a red pen editing Facebook group, which is private to those members. And we just, you know, exchange things in there. And I publish editing tips daily. The book itself is available on Amazon, $2.99. Um, and the people who are in red pen editing do have the option to uh, attend other things if I do them during the year. Um, and the mentoring is, is sort of on top of that. The mentoring is uh, starts from £25 a month. And that's a, a very small group. There's no more than a dozen of us in the group. Um, so that I can give individual attention. Uh, the Scrivener side is all free. Uh, people can attend the Simply Scrivener specials. Uh, they can read the blog. Uh, I post tips every day on Scrivener and that's all for nothing. Somebody did write to me the other day and said, where am I supposed to pay for Scrivener? I can't see how, you know, how to pay for it. I said, well, you don't. It's just, it's there. Please enjoy it. Goodness. So. Well, well, thank you, Anne. I mean, the, the amount you know is quite phenomenal on these topics it's right. it's been so incredibly helpful i've learned a huge amount myself if people work with you on a one-to-one -one basis and uh, let's say they've written their they've written their first three chapters do, would you look at the th first three chapters and say look at this and then the, i mean typically would you look at three chapters and the outline and and then give people some feedback then or do you tend to take people from the beginning or wait till they've got to the end before you what we do them? is we have an initial chat uh, by by either skype or or something whatever suits about where they're at what their aim issues are you having um and you know where do you think i can help you it's really important the chemistry works between us because it's really important the chemistry works between us mm. and then um basically yes they can send me their either scrivener file or their uh, whatever they're working in and i will just read whatever um they have sent and I will give them advice as to how to move. The red pen system is I only give them three tasks at a time because my experience is let, fewer than three, they, it's not enough. More than three is um, challenging, uh, but um, I balance those three. So one of the tasks will be really, really easy. One of them will be harder and one of them will be frankly quite hard. And the idea is that they, they work on that for as long as it takes them. And then they come back to me and say, I've got issues on this or whatever. In the monthly metering, issues that have come up during the month are aired amongst all the people there so if somebody says i'm having real problems with my main character or um uh, please somebody explain to me how you do a timeline or um you know it, it's all nitty gritty stuff you know um that people mm. have issues with last month uh, we talked about <laughs> we talked about how to get out of the day when you wake up and think, what is the point? We're all going to die from this virus. I might as well stop writing my novel right now and just, just go and bury myself in the garden. Um, so we had a quite a light-hearted, um, you know, tongue-in-cheek uh, session to lift everyone's spirits. Um, at other times, like the beginning of the year, we might do one on a motivation for the year, you know, planning for the year. Uh, it depends on the, all the conversations I've had with individuals during that month. I think back at what were the common threads. I then post in our group, there's another Facebook private group for them. Um, this is what I think we're gonna cover, but please let me know if you want me to cover anything else. And I'll, we cover it. Um, and it's very, it's very relaxed. Um, the people, most of the people who are um, in my group don't tell anybody else they're in it. 
um, because it kind of implies that you needed help. But actually, you know, I've got a mentor mm. I go to for mm. my writing. It's nice to sound it off on somebody else. Yeah. Um, but it's that. Uh, but I do help a lot. Sometimes I actually, with one particular lady in particular, she said, you know, can you not just read it and edit it for me? Well, I don't want to do full time editing because I'm, you know, past that. I'm too old uh, to get back into full time working. So I will go through a few chapters and pick out the things that she needs to look at in the whole of her book. So, you know, common mistakes she's making. In fact, I'm writing a blog at the moment. It's going to go out next Monday about what I do um, de developmental wise. It's going out on Monday. I haven't finished writing it yet. Uh, Where is your blog? Because I, I was looking for it. It's on scrivenavirgin.com. It's oh. one of the headings at the top. There's news. And then news is where you the advert for today is. And um, on the you always well, it's always about Scrivener, nearly always written by me. But occasionally I have a guest post from somebody who is mad keen on Scrivener and wants to share how they're oh. using it. Okay, thank you. Well, um, as we've just run over by about seven minutes, uh, does anybody have a final question? We could probably take one or two final questions. I shall just wait to see if anybody does have any questions. But nothing's arriving yet. Um, let me see if I had another question for you that hasn't been asked. I, I was going to ask a question about padding. Um, <laughs> what do you, I mean, if people follow all these nuts and bolts, because it's like there are lots of moving parts here and what we need to have, and then then people might think well i need to link these together and link them together with perhaps some description or something so if people want to add padding what sort of stuff works or should they not have any padding well i, I wouldn't call that padding i'd call that transitions and and transitions are uh, they're quite hard to write actually uh, you, it's uh, if, if you've just i had a story that i was working on a little while ago they had um a phone call from one of their daughters about something nothing to do with the story uh, and then she went back into a reverie about when the children were small and the phone call actually triggered the memory and I think what if you're trying to do transitions you need to see what you had at the end of the previous chapter what you what you're planning to put next is putting the chapters together can be a juggling act as well uh, you need to have something which is common to the end of one chapter and the beginning of the next even if it's common because it's opposite even if it's common because uh you know mm. that was the occasion i said yes next chapter i'll tell you when i said no you know it's kind of it's that kind of thing so it's not really padding mm. it's more smoothing the journey encouraging them to turn the page over and read the next bit if you've got a scene a, a whole chunk of an anecdote as it were that should be legitimately part of the chapter you know, it shouldn't be mm. an add-on, as it were. Padding mm. is what I call when people uh, think, well, their word count's not long enough and they need to get it a bit longer. So they start making their sentences longer by, you know, just adding an extra clause here and an extra bit there. And you think, no, it, it, it needs to be right down to the bare bones. I mean, I'm, when I'm, I'm editing currently my Deadwood book, and I, I'm, I'm, I can't remember which chapter I'm on now, but eight, third draft. And I literally, any sentence that I can cut, I cut it. Mm. I look at it thinking no nope, you're going mm. it really has to be it's ruthless when you get to that point so no I don't I'm not an advocate of padding full stop but transitions transitions are hard mm. yeah thank you thank you so uh we haven't had any extra questions um so I ha we've covered a lot I expect people are feeling slightly befuddled so I, I have I so I have added the um, the slides here in the chat. If people can pick that up, um, you can also email me, joe at joeparfit.com. Um, don't forget, everybody, that I run Speed Right Live on a Friday at five Dutch time for UK time, which you're all able to to attend you just have to register on my website that's free i'm running a number of other sessions there's an in conversation that happens every two or three weeks my next one is on finding your feet in poetry with the um the young uh, performance poet and award-winning poet anthony anaxagoru um, and that's on the 18th so do keep an eye on my website and see what's coming up and i also write a monthly newsletter called the monthly inspirer where i i give free um 
ideas, connections, and um, tell you about all the things that are coming up. Um, and if anybody's interested in trying something of mine, I am writing a program, I have been writing a program called the Life Story Jar, which is about writing your life stories. And if you go to my website, joeparfit.com, you can do a trial lesson for absolutely free. And there is one lesson that you can do live in a group once a month as well. And the next one's on the 24th of June. So um, I hope to see some of you I don't know now. I hope to see you again, see you at something else. Some of the people who I know who Anne does, doesn't know or didn't know, I urge you to get in touch with Anne. She's really very nice, even though she seems <laughs> to know so much. She's extremely nice because I worked with her on editing in the uh, workshop I went to with her and she, she's great. So thank you all very much indeed for attending. This will be record be saved and it will appear on my website within the next week so thank you all very much and thank you for your lovely comments everybody it's been an absolute joy i love learning and it's an absolute pleasure for me to do this thank you Anne. you're welcome i really enjoyed myself